England, that is. I was reading this week. By the way, let me give you a little bit of a gist of what we're going to do today. Also, take your hymn book and turn to 420. Because uh, we're going to preach through a hymn today. This hymn was written in the uh, the 1700s, and uh, it takes a little modern interpretation because it uses the, the old King James type language, <coughs> but uh, I remember singing this song all growing up. It's, uh, it's got two names. It, some people call it, I will arise and, call, and uh, go to Jesus, and our hymn book has it listed as come ye sinners, poor and needy. And um, I kind of gave it a title this morning as Invitation and Warning, because the song contains both. But the song was written by a man named Joseph Hart. And Joseph was raised in a Christian home. But let me go back to the city of London for just a moment. The author of this book <clears throat> that gives stories behind <clears throat> the different hymns, when he was talking about if you ever visit London, go to a place called Bunhill Fields, and a little cemetery is located across from John, uh, John Wesley's house and the chapel where he preached. And it's an interesting little cemetery because 
there are a lot of people whose names you might know or who wrote hymns that you might know were buried there because they were not allowed to be buried in the sacred cemeteries of the day because they were considered dissenters of the faith. They didn't go along with the Church of England and so on. And so <clears throat> they were not allowed the religious cemeteries. And uh, some people like Isaac Watts, uh, who's considered really the father of British hymnody, English hymnody, Susanna Wesley, <laughs> Uh, Joseph Swain, David Denham, Samuel Stinnett. I didn't know those names, but I do know Samuel <laughs> Stinnett wrote On Jordan, Stormy Banks I Stand, and Cast a Wishful Eye. And John Rapon is buried there, and he, he was the one who wrote Our Firm Foundation. But Joseph Hart, the person that wrote this, is also there. Joseph was raised in a Christian home. But as a lot of teenagers do, he strayed considerably during a number of years after his teenage years. And uh, he even uh, wrote a book called The Unreasonableness of Religion. And um, I thought that sounded like it might make a good sermon title someday. <laughs> because you know the statements I make about religion in and of itself. But finally, at age 45, after a bout of depression, he fell under deep spiritual conviction. He had listened to a message based on Revelation 3.10. And uh, he hurried home and got on his knees and prayed and repented of his straying ways and uh, came back to the Lord. And in, in 1759, after he had written many songs, this, this hymn, this poem actually got published as a poem. And it's got an old American melody, uh, according to its sense, and some people say Southern melody, depending on which book you're reading about it. But the interesting thing that I found, and really this, he wrote it and it's like his personal testimony. But I, when I read through it, as many times as I did this week, I, I saw some patterns that were really, really incredible and I really uh, enjoyed working through this. The chorus goes, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms and in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. Betty, would you play a little bit for us? I'm going to sing, I'm gonna sing the first verse uh, just in case you've never heard it before. <coughs> are you familiar with the song? I believe it's in B flat minor. <laughs> Come ye sinners poor and needy Weak and wounded, sick and sore Jesus ready stands to save you Full of pity, love and power I will such an incredible, poignant, pointed message. It doesn't mix words. Now, I realize the words are kind of from the King James era. You remember the King James Bible was written in 1611. So they still had the thes and the thous and the yees and so on. And uh, for 
speaking on it in the modern setting like we are today, we don't talk that way anymore. So uh, unless we're singing some of the hymns that still have those words in it, or whether we're, we may be reading the, the King James Bible. But the first thing to notice about this song is that there's an invitation. When he heard that message on Revelation 3.10, in fact, let's read that real quickly. Now, this, this passage was written to the church at Philadelphia. Many people say that that was the one church that did what God told them to. And that's the reason uh, if you start in uh, verse 7, and the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right, the angel would be the pastor of the church, the way that John wrote his, uh, this book. He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one open, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one will shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those days of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and not, but lie. I will make them know that I have loved you. Now this is the verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, we know that he's speaking of the tribulation there and that the Christians will not be there to go through the tribulation, the great tribulation. Uh, it's not saying we won't have trials and tribulations on earth, but the great tribulation that's spoken about many times, and we get a big picture of it if you read through the entire book of Revelation. But that message on that passage of scripture is the one that turned Joseph's heart, life, Joseph's heart's life around. But it says, come, ye sinners. Well, we know based on many other scriptures that we're all sinners. Uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jerry brought that up while we was uh studying Sunday school. We, we know that we are all sinners, but here's the thing. Acknowledging that you're a sinner is one thing. Turning from that sin in repentance and turning to Christ is something else completely different. But I love the fact that when he wrote this poem, he did not leave anybody out. He said, come you sinners, and then he elaborated on what that meant. There's three categories that he brought forth right away. If you're poor and needy, category one. If you're weak and you're wounded, category three. If you're sick and sore, Jesus stands ready, or ready stands, that type of language, that language style. Jesus, ready, stands to save you, full of pity. Another word for pity would be grace, forgiveness, but full of pity, love, and power. So let's go back to poor and needy. So he's saying your, your financial status doesn't necessarily qualify you for anything good from God. And it doesn't matter how poor or how needy you are in your situation, Jesus stands ready to meet your need where you are. Some people in certain times of their life are poor. They're financially poor. They're needy. They don't have enough food to eat. They may not have their, uh, a good place to, to, to bed down. They may not have a, a good house to live in. But he said, come anyway. Come to Jesus. <laughs> Next, he says, weak and wounded. Well, sometimes you're wounded by people. Probably the primary cause.
cause of anxiety today is people talking about other people saying things either that aren't true or that are nobody's business and don't need to be said. And the Bible speaks to that. Where it says, you know, it's an abomination to speak those things done in secret. He's talking about the brethren, but it really goes across the board. And, and I'm not just speaking of just gossip, but gossip's obviously included. Gossip is kind of a, a big, broad thing. But the thing of it is, it doesn't matter how weak you are. You could be weak from sickness, but he might be speaking of weakness towards sin, that you just don't seem to have the strength to stand up against the sin in your own life. I mean, I mean, we all sin every day, but sometimes people, perhaps with an addiction, are weak against that drug and wounded. I mean, yeah, it could be physically wounded, but it's not really speaking of, of a physical wound. It's speaking of wounds, the wounds that life can bring your way and that leave you in some state of anxiety or debilitated. And then he brings up another category of people, the sick and the sore. Now, we know that Jesus said, bring the sick to me. And he's concerned about that. The sick and the sore, those that have physical maladies. Maybe your sore is your arthritis or uh, some other physical uh, injury or debilitation that could actually cause you to be in the category of duty. Or maybe you're just plain sick. You're just plain sick. But the key is it does is that it doesn't matter what one of these three categories you may find yourself in, and you might think, well, all three apply on some level in my life, but it doesn't matter in the sense that you can't bring it to God because he says again that second part of the verse is Jesus stands ready. Jesus is standing ready to meet you, whatever your level of need is. Whatever your level of anxiety, whatever you're going through in life, he stands ready. But he's speaking more to the point of not just physical malady, but he's pointing people to Jesus. Because Jesus stands ready to save you, no matter what condition you think you is your life is experiencing Jesus stands ready he's full of pity he, it's as if he's standing there you may picture him on the cross with his arms stretched out but that's like beckoning beckoning to you and he's bringing to the table for your understanding for your level for your life he's bringing love because in spite of all that may be going wrong with your <laughs> physical, personal existence, Jesus is there. He's ready. He's ready to meet your need. And he's willing, he's ready to bring love and he's ready to bring power. And then he's kind of giving a personal testimony next, he said, in the chorus. <coughs> So say to yourself, I think he's implying, you say this to yourself, even though he's writing the song, I will rise. Say to yourself, I will rise and go to Jesus. <clears throat> it's kind of like the prodigal son. What did he say? The Bible says he came to himself. He, he came to his senses, in one translation says. And he says... <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> I will rise and go to my father. Because this is not a good place to be. Where I am is no place anybody should be. But my father's helpers have more than I've got. 
you know the rest of that story. I will arise and go to Jesus and he will embrace me. He will embrace me in his arms, just like the prodigal son was embraced by his father. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Comfort, peace, freedom from anxiety, joy. And then in verse 2, he splits it up a little bit too. Come ye thirsty. Well, this one of the Beatitudes, blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for he shall be filled. If you don't realize your need for salvation, you may not want it. But when you find yourself in a situation and you need some level of saving, God is bountiful. It says God's free bounty glorify. So come, you know, so they're thirsty. Come and welcome God's free bounty. Glorify true belief and true repentance. Every grace brings you nigh. So when we realize and understand that the grace of God has got us, and we've experienced some of that in our life, and we've come to an idea of repentance, God's grace is there, not to just re receive us, but if you've ever been in your life when you had a period of time where you drifted away from God and you came to your senses one day and realized, oh, well, I don't need to be going this direction, so I'm going to go back. You find His grace and He draws you back and He brings you closer to Him. That word nigh, we don't use it anymore. But it brings you close. Then he goes in a little bit different direction for those that may not feel like they're weak and uh, poor and needy and weak and wounded and sick and sore. They don't think they're in a position where they need to seek God at all. Maybe at that moment in their life, life is good. But they look at what Jesus has to offer. And I have had this literally happen to me. Was witnessing to a man. We were out in the country. In fact, we were standing by a, 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 a water pump <laughs> engine in a field. Talking to him about the Lord, Pastor and I. And... Uh, he was really close to accepting the Lord. And he said, but I'm not going to do it until I know I can live it. And I tried to help him see that that was the point. <laughs> because none of us can truly live it to the nth degree because we need his strength, his, that love and power that was talked about uh, in verse 1. But what does he say? Come, you weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined. Now, if you're that way, you have to realize that you're that way, that life has brought you to a point. But you are ruined. And then he says, by the fall. <clears throat> and we know that's a scriptural reference by the cause of the fall of mankind and we're all under that curse of the fall of Adam and Eve so we're all sinners we're born sinners we're not sinners because we sin we sin because we're a sinner it's in our nature to do that so if you tarry uh, so if you're lost and ruined by the fall now you're realizing it but then you say well, yeah, I know that the grace of God is out there. I know that Jesus is standing there waiting for me to say yes. <clears throat> but not right now. You know, I, I, I got plenty of time. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the Lord later. 
you know, I want to do what I want to do right now. We've all heard people say things like that. So here's the warning, he says. If you tarry, if you wait until you're better, or maybe better is the situation that you're in, maybe it could be financial, it could be uh, you're young and you haven't found that that one person you want to spend your life with and you're waiting till life comes together a little bit more here's the warning if you tarry until you're better until things look have a little bit better look to them you will never come at all let me read the whole verse now come ye weary heavy laden lost and ruined by the fall if you tarry till you're better, <laughs> you will never come at all. Because when we put God off, it seems like the voice of God gets a little quieter and a little quieter because life gets so much busier. And there's so many things to, to grab onto our attention spans mine's not very long, but okay. But if you carry, the real <laughs> danger is you'll never find the time. You'll never find the right time. You know, the Bible never <laughs> says there's a right time. Well, it kind of does, because it says now. Jesus' words himself. Now is the time. So when you come to the realization that Jesus loves you so much that he died on the cross so that you can repent of your sinfulness and turn to him and he will take you into his kingdom. <coughs> then you need to do it. He says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Today is the day. Then he says, in verse 4, I want to think about it. <coughs> Somebody might think that. I want to ponder what you're talking about. I want to, <coughs> I want to look at the logic behind all of this. Let not conscience, he says, make you linger. <coughs> nor of fitness fondly dream. Well, when I get, and it's really not talking about physical fitness, well, it could be involved, <coughs> but like, well, when I get my act together and I straighten up, you know, and I start doing better things, and see, that goes back to the logic of the thinking of the days gone by when people have to earn their right to come to Jesus. We know that that's not the way Jesus designed it. Because look at what look at look at what Joseph says with this. Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. And they're never going to be worthy. All the fitness that he requireth is for you to feel your need of him. So the only requirement come to Jesus is to realize you need him. That's all I require. I once heard a preacher say, and I've heard many preachers say this, and I've said it myself way more than once. You can't get saved until you get lost. If you don't understand that you're lost and undone without Jesus Christ in your life, 
then there's no hope for your salvation. If you don't realize that you have that need, you're not going to be trying to fulfill that need. You're not going to be looking for a way that that need could be met. That's the reason when I began to share with people, one of the first scriptures I use is that, that Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're a live human being. So back to that first verse. Come, ye sinners. Poor and needy. Weak and wounded, sick and sore. <laughs> Jesus ready stands to save you. Full of pity and love. So the power of God, the rightness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is available to everyone who will come. And I love the way Joseph put it in that last verse. Let my conscience make you linger. <coughs> nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness that he requires is to feel your need of him. Then that chorus, if you're in a situation, maybe this is what you should say to yourself once you realize you need Jesus. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. If you've never come to the point in your life where you received Jesus into your life and made him the boss of who you think you are, I would encourage you right now to bow and ask Jesus to come into your life because he stands ready to save you right now. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this moment of time that we get to share together and we get to glean from your word and thank you for this wonderful hymn writer has written a hymn that is biblically sound that can encourage us to reach out into the fullness of Christ and let him Apply his grace to our life. So Lord, today, for those under the sound of my voice, I pray, Lord, that they would reach out to you and receive you into their life right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand as we say? Thank you for loving us, for we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.